Reading the map. Reading Stull's map is one of the most powerful tools we have in all of Glazes. Stull's map gives us perspective. It allows us to take a formula on a page and translate it into real results and to see why is that glaze doing what it's doing? Is it working? Is it not? What should I do with this glaze? And that's an incredibly powerful tool. Now the map itself is something that's a bit intimidating to look at. It needs a little bit of interpretation. And that's what we're going to talk about in this segment. What's the map telling me? Now, of course, Stull's original map was drawn in 1912. This is just a redraw by Derek Al from Glazy, and it just, it's nicer to read. It's a little bit cleaner, and we'll look at the original map again here in the next section. But the thing to know about Stull's map is that it's pretty straightforward as long as you've got your footing. Of course, Stull's original map was drawn for Cone 11, and the question is always, well, he's working at Cone 11. Does this still apply at Cone 6? And the answer is absolutely 100% yes, but we have to use some of the rules of Cone 6 that we're going to develop later in this workshop. But let's look at the map itself first. So this is the original map that Stull drew in 1912, and we have to look at what it has to offer it and what it's showing us. The first thing to understand is that the map is plotting molecules of silica along the bottom axis and molecules of alumina along the vertical axis. Of course, those are our glass formers. They're making the glass, so they're going to control what the glass becomes. And then we have to look at the internal sections. We start at zero silicon alumina and we go up. Now there are numerical values and we'll talk about the importance of them later, but the short version is if you plug your glaze into a UMF calculator, it'll give you these numbers and you find their place on the map in places like Glazy or My Glaze Calculator will just do it for you automatically. It'll just drop a point on the map and show you where your glaze is. So we've got silica and alumina, and inside the map we've got a bunch of sections, and they're a little bit hard to read, so let's highlight some of them. Here in the middle, the blue section is bright. Bright was Stull's term for glossy. And what this is saying is that if you convert your glaze's formula to chemistry and it falls in this section, it will be glossy. If there's discrepancies, again, you have to look to what's going on. What are the variables in there? But for the most part, if your glaze falls inside the glossy section of the map, it will be glossy. Similarly, we've got two sections. This one says semi-matte and this one says matte. And those are really one big matte region, but he's making a distinction between how matte those glazes are, how rough of a texture they develop, and where they fall will dictate the texture of that glaze. Now we do have two more sections. One says unfused and one says devitrified. This terminology was not 100% accurate. Both of these areas are actually just under fired. Um, the one on the left side is under fired because it has too much alumina and the one on the right is under fired because it has too much silica, but they're both under fired and we'll look at how we know that in a, in a, in a little bit. But of course, that, that's what the map is showing us. Now there are some interpretive skills that take that are needed to to look at this map and to understand what it's doing but really that's it does your glaze fall in the glossy section in the matte section or in the under fired section and is it meeting its expectation and if it's not we need to think about that glaze a little bit more now of course i'm showing you this as just a drawing as a cartoon um, but does that mean that this is real a lot of people would argue well ceramic science doesn't apply to artists uh and that is, how do we say nonsense? Ceramic science absolutely applies to artists. The same people will say, well, artists use materials differently and so it doesn't really apply. Again, nonsense. Those are excuses that are made that for people that can't see the full picture of what ceramic science has to offer. And the map is really what the most powerful tool is. Some people say, well, the map was created in a lab and, and, and lab doesn't work for us. And this was made using specialty materials and specialty kilns. And again, that's completely and utterly one untrue. But to really understand the power of the map, you need to see the map in real life. And that's what I've created for you here. This is a recreation of Stull's map with real glazes made with the same materials that we all use, nepheline cyanite and calcium carbonate, kaolin, silica, frit 3134, 
because this map was made at cone six, because using the tools that we'll talk about down the road in this workshop, we're going to learn how we bring that temperature down to cone six. But this is very real. These glazes are not a theory. These are true. You'll notice that the glossy section of the map in this drawing falls between the purple and the red lines. And look at all the glossy glazes. They're oh so glossy. The purple line delineates the separation between the glossy section and the matte section. Well, amazingly enough, if you look at the glazes on the left side of the purple line, they are matte. And if you look at the glazes on the right side of the map, they are glossy just as the map predicts. Now, this recreation is not the full map. I just made the section outlined in blue here, um, but it's enough of the map to show that it's really real. The red lines indicate the separation between the glossy section and the underfired, and we can see that here. You see, this glaze here is very glossy, and the glaze next to it looks glossy, but we need to use a little bit of interpretive skill in this, because if you see this little nub right here, well, that nub is from the dip application of the glaze, and it never melted, and that's a problem. The whole point of making our glazes is to have them melt. That's how we know these glazes are under fired. That's the power that the map gives us. These are real. The glazes absolutely translate from the regular materials that I use to materials all around the world. It doesn't matter in what continent you're on uh, uh, or how you're working with glaze, the rules of the map still hold. And that is the power because this is very, very real. Now, there are some other features of maps, some things that are true, some shortcomings in the map, and we need to look at those as well. Now, the first is this hatch marked region in Stahl's original drawing. And this hatch marked region is very interesting because this defines crazing. You see, crazing is a real condition that can be defined by the map because crazing is a chemistry issue. Crazing is about the relationship between the thermal expansion of the glaze and the thermal expansion of the exact clay body you are using. You see, there's all sorts of myth and legend about why glazes are crazing, but a lot of it's nonsense. It's just thermal expansion. You'll often hear the, oh, I can't open my kiln until it gets to whatever temperature because it'll craze. No, 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 no. It was going to craze anyway, you're just hearing it happen because crazing is always based on a chemical relationship and not on when you open the kiln. That's just circumstance. But the crazing region does have some variables to it. One is that it has a very specific shape. The problem is crazing is always based on the relationship between the glaze you have and the specific clay body. We consistently see this with glazes that quote unquote craze on my porcelain but not on my stoneware. Well, those are two different clay bodies with two very different thermal expansions, which mean they're going to have a different relationship with the same glaze. So one clay body will craze and another one won't. But with that interpretive skill, we can come to see how we can see what our glazes are doing and how we can fix them. Now, this was where the crazing region fell on Stull's clay body, but the crazing region can move in and out depending on what your clay body is. But the important detail is that the shape of the crazing region stays the same. And again, this isn't theory, this is real, because we return to my recreation of the map. Now, if you look closely, you will see that my crazing region is not in the same space as Stull's crazing region. My crazing region goes much higher on the map. Well, that's because the clay body I was using has different thermal expansion than the clay body that Stull used. And so I move move up on the map, but the shape of the crazing region is still the same. The way the behavior moves throughout the map continues. It's just on my clay body, it moves differently. But we can see some fascinating features like the intensity of the crazing and how that changes um, as we move away, in, away from the crazing region, that the crazes get less intense or more intense as we move down. And all of this is very real. Again, crazing is not just some theory or something that happens because you open too fast. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. It's just a reality of chemistry. 
Now, Stahl's map is not without its flaws. One of the greatest flaws on Stahl's map he went to address in his future work. But because in the sciences we like to stay authentic to the, the original, we've never really gone back and changed it. And that's the implication that everything melts. You see, in Stahl's map, all the glossy area, all the way up here, shows that it's bright, that it's glossy, implying that all of that melts. That's not really true. And in fact, we have a much smaller melting region at our particular temperature than we would have uh, uh, at other temperatures. So in, in most of versions of the map, the rainbow area here indicates when glazes are well melted. Everything in red is really going to be under fired. And again, it's a flaw that's still addressed in later work, but it's just not here on his original map. Again, it takes some interpretive skill, but as long as you get yourself comfortable with these concepts, you'll find those changes pretty quickly. And we can see that on my map here. You see, as we get into the highest levels of alumina, at the top of my map, you'll see that my glossy section isn't all that glossy, and you'll see some of these dipping nubs. Well, that's because that's where the glaze starts to become under fired. In this particular case, about 0.7 alumina. Now I know that that's a number and I'm throwing it at you, but we're going to develop these interpretive skills as we go. But the important thing is, is that the details of the map do really hold. The general concept holds. Glossy is glossy, matte is matte, crazing is crazing. And now we have perspective on where our glazes fall and what may or may not be worth working with them, and that's going to be the power as we go forward. And even more powerful is, as I said, this is at cone six. We're going to look in upcoming segments as what happens when I fire this to cone five or what happens when I fire this to cone seven? How does temperature really work? We're going to get to all of that in upcoming segments. But for now, in review, Stull's map predicts how a glaze is going to behave glossy, matte, or under-fired at any temperature as long as we understand the tools of temperature that we're going to get to in a future segment. As well as things like crazing and starting to learn to interpret our place on the map because if there's a major discrepancy between what the map is saying and what you're getting, something is wrong. But of course, through all of this, interpretation is required as a skill to make the most of the map, and we're going to learn that in future segments.